let me recap for just a moment uh, this last couple of weeks. So we've been in this series called The Art of Neighboring, and I showed you a neighborhood map. I'm going to put it up on the screen one more time. There's one in your worship guide again today, but this neighborhood map shows your home in the center and eight possible homes that are around you. You might not live in a symmetrical sort of diagram like this, but there are eight people, eight families, eight neighbors right around you uh, that you can connect with. And we said this, if we were to take the great command seriously, which says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might and love your neighbor as yourself. If we were to take that seriously with the eight homes, eight families closest to us, what would that look like? And, and we, we agreed there were some people we don't even know that are in those eight homes that we would say are in the stranger category. Maybe we know they're there, but that's about it. Some of those, maybe they're acquaintances. We might actually know their name. We might wave at them. And then some of those people we have relationship with that we know something about them. They know something about us and we have consistency sort of in their lives. And we said, if we're to take the great command seriously, then we are, especially with our neighbors right around us, we are going to have to move from being strangers to in relationship with these people. And that, that might be messy. It might not always be easy, uh, but we are going to have to do our part to be faithful to what God called us to do in his son, Jesus. It's actually what disciples of Jesus do. Love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love their neighbors as themselves. And sure, everybody in our path is our neighbor, but that includes the eight homes, the eight families that are right around us, and we should take that uh, seriously. And so today, what I want to talk a little bit about is the power of sharing. And to do that, we're going to launch out of a passage, Acts chapter 4, 13 to 20, I'm going to ask you to stand while we read the word, and if you're our guest, we say this phrase, the very words at the end of the main text, uh, reading to distinguish God's word from my own. Acts chapter 4, 13 to 20. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave, the council they conferred with to uh, to one another said, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name." So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. You may be seated. Now, in context, Peter and John have been a part of a miracle that the whole city has witnessed. They've been sort of imprisoned for it, and then let loose and put, uh, well, come before a council. And this council has said to them, no more talking about Jesus and how these miracles are taking place in his name. And Peter and John, their answer is, and and the verse that I'm most uh, uh, concerned about this morning is, is verse 20. Their answer to the council is, for we cannot speak but speak of what we have seen and and heard. It's true that we share what is most significant to us, is it not? We naturally do that. I think naturally is an important word. We naturally share the things that are most significant to us. When our kids were uh, much smaller, the older two especially, we went through that sort of stage in life where they both had eczema. Has anybody ever... struggled with that or, oh man, it was awful. And when your kids have it, they wake you up in the night, they're scratching themselves, bloody sheets, all that kind of stuff. If you somehow avoided eczema, bless the Lord. Um, But if you didn't, you know what what I'm talking about. And we went to the doctor and we, we were trying to figure out what's going on and they would give us different steroid creams and all of that. And Angela, uh, is a, 
a smart kid, my, my wife, she started doing all this research and she said, you know what we need to do? We need to get a water softener. Maybe this has to do with water. And so we did. We, we, you know, I felt like I had to mortgage the house to buy a water softener. So expensive. I remember thinking like, what in the world? Like, but I'm going to trust my wife on this. Well, over time, their skin started to clear up. And we talked to the doctor about it, and they said, yeah, sure, that could, that could be one of the, one of the reasons why uh, the, the, they have eczema, and, and we've had a water softener ever since. And I'm telling you, every time any parent for the last 15 years has asked us about my kid's struggling with eczema, what, did you guys have that? What did you do? We have said, you need to look at rain soft water softeners. We could be the poster kids for... Rain soft, water softener. If I had a dollar for everyone we spent uh, or, or bought or sold, is what I'm trying to say, to somebody else, I would be a rich man because Angela is sharing what is significant to her all the time. Uh, we do. We share what's significant to us. I talk about Israel a lot because in 2006, I went to Israel for the first time I walked these ancient paths with my Bible open, and I began to understand the text in context. I already had a seminary degree, already had a doctoral degree, and I'm telling you, in 2006, in 10 days, I learned more about the Bible in 10 days than I had learned in two degrees focused on the Bible, and it changed me. It it allowed me to begin to think like an Easterner would think when they began to approach this Eastern document called the Bible. It opened my eyes to the pictures that Jesus was showing people as he taught. In fact, I often thought of Jesus a lot as God, which seemed a little bit nebulous to me, but it taught me who he was as a man, his culture, his town. His, it changed me, taught me what a disciple was. And so I tell people about it all the time. I invite people to it all the time. Why? Because it was significant to me. We share the things, naturally share the things that are significant to us. And that's what Peter and John are saying here. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard because their experience with Jesus has been so significant to them, they are naturally going to do it. No law is going to be able to stop them from naturally sharing what's changed everything for them. There's power in sharing. How many of you are on social media of any sort? Just raise your hand, be loud, be proud. It's not, not wrong. Um, so how many of you are on Facebook particularly? Okay. So if you're on Facebook, you know that you can like something. Everybody go like this. I like it. I like what you said there. Uh, you can like something or you can share something. Right? If you like something, it doesn't matter if you get a million likes, it's a million likes, but if you got a million shares, then you would change the world with that message because it becomes, uh, it multiplies, it, becomes mo- it, it gains so much momentum because people are sharing it. What does it take for someone to share something? Well, that message, whatever it is, has to be so significant that they're going to move beyond the, I like what that says, to all of my friends, whoever they are, need to hear what that guy just said or that gal just said. And so then you take the extra millisecond to share it, right? We share the things that are significant to us. And sharing is powerful. Uh, there's power in sharing, and Jesus uh, knew it. And so what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is that power and a process that I'm going to show you one more slide here that illustrates the process just in words. And it is the process of sharing where we invest in people, and then we invite people, and then we include people. So rem- all you got to do is remember these three words, invest, invite, and include. And I want to talk about those three things as a process of sharing in a powerful way. So first we invest in people. All that means is that we are loving our neighbors or other people that we live and work with. We are loving them like Jesus loves them. The great commandment is very clear. I'll restate it once again so we're all on the same page. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart And with all your soul and with all your might, this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. 
right? So to invest is to love someone like Jesus loves them. Why, do, why would we even do that? We don't, really, we don't really love people in order to convert them as Christians. We love because we have been converted. The, the only reason we, we love is because we realize God so loved us that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So our love is like that. Remember, Jesus died on a cross for everyone, and his love was genuine whether they, they respected that and received him or rejected him. He just loved them, right, by going to the cross. Now, this is the same kind of love that we are supposed to have. We don't love with a gimmick or with an ulterior motive, but we love because Jesus first loved us. I hope you know, as Christians, we aren't selling anything. We're not trying to sell anything. Uh, we are just loving people genuinely. This was the command. Love your neighbor as yourself. We invest with hope. We love with hope. Uh, but we don't have any expectation on return. It's genuine. I love you no matter what. It's like my, my kids, right? I hope that they all come to know Jesus and walk with him all of their days. But I'm not going to stop loving them if they reject him right? Because the love is genuine. And the same is true with every person that you come in contact with, especially your neighbors. There's no ulterior motive here. Now, you know what an ulterior motive is, right? It's something that is kept concealed in the context of the relationship or the conversation. You ever get that phone call that tells you you've just won four days and three nights in sunny Orlando, and all you have to do is show up for a meeting in Orlando. It's just gonna take 60 minutes and you just need to watch this presentation and then you can go and by the end of that meeting, you've bought a timeshare and you've spent, you know, a million dollars. I'm just exaggeration, but you know what I mean. Ulterior motives, right? Sometimes Christians or not, really, I'm just gonna say religious people. Sometimes religious people have ulterior motives in the way that they love people. So it might look something like this, like maybe you're, you're thinking to yourself, I, I, my motive is that person, whoever that neighbor is, would become converted. And so I'm going to invite them over to my house and I'm, we're going to have a great dinner and a great time. And at the end of that dinner, that dinner is going to be followed with something called a testament. Does anybody know what a testament is? It is a meant with a message. All right. So this is true. It's not a joke. They have these at Lifeway. You could go buy them now. I want to throw them in the floor and jump on top of them and crush them all to bits every time I'm, I'm there. Why? Because this is a gimmick. This is an ulterior motive. It's saying, uh, you know what? I've invited someone over and I'm going to use this thing called a testament to really work my motive at the end of that, that, that deal. And pe people do those things in all kinds. If you Google this cheesy religious stuff like that, there's a lot of things that you could look at where you could use these gimmicks. Now, let me just tell you, we live in a culture where people uh, are weary of gimmicks. Okay. Um, I hope you know about the Forby area, about the place we live in. Certainly, there are people here that have never been in church. They're, they, they've never gone to church. They, you know, you, that, you're, that are your neighbors. But there are also a lot of your neighbors who have had some sort of church experience or religious experience and rejected it and said, I don't want that because, and you fill in the blank, the people are hypocritical, the way I was treated, something happened to my family. I don't know, we could go on and on and on. But, but a lot of people left the church either not liking it or just being hurt uh, by it. So you have to realize that's where people are. And when you come at them with what I'm gonna call a proverbial cheese, a testament, a gimmick, an ulterior motive, it just pushes them farther away, right? So we have to understand in the context of our relationship, we are loving people for the sake of love because Jesus first loved us. We do not have any ulterior motives. We're gonna love them whether they ever come to Christ or not. We do have an ultimate motive though, and that is a desired destination. Sure, 
in every relationship, every person that I love, I want them to know Jesus. Why? Because I know what he did inside of me. He gave me a new identity. He changed me from a person who the scripture calls, uh, at, uh, described like this, that I was at war with God because of my sin. But God was winning, and I, I lived in that long enough to know and understand that it, it just is a, um, a trap and a bondage and a cage. And I look back at what Jesus did for me. I couldn't rescue myself. I couldn't work my own way to heaven. That's exhausting. There's nothing I could have ever done to get there. But Jesus died on a cross to save me from my sins, rose again from heaven, and the scripture teaches me, he gave me a new identity. He said, when I came to him, I was born again, all over again. Meaning, he doesn't even look at me the same way. I was at war with him. Now I'm his son because of Jesus. Now I'm forgiven completely. Now uh, I'm living eternal life now. Like you, you see me, this body will die, but my soul will live forever. One day I'll get a new body according to the, to the scripture, all because of what Jesus did. It changed me significantly. If I, if I even begin to go down the path of who would I be today without Jesus, it's scary. I know he changed me completely. And so I'm going to share that naturally with people, naturally because I love them. I want them to know the same Jesus and have the opportunity to be changed, but I'm going to love them with no ulterior motive. I'm going to love them like Jesus uh, loved them. And so the first thing that we do then is invest in people by loving them without ulterior motives. We just love them. Second thing we do here is we invite Okay, we invite people. When we invite people, <clears throat> I don't know what you think about when, when, I, when a pastor in a church says, I want you to invite them. Here's what I would like for you to invite them to. I would invite you to, lead, uh, to, to, to take their next step toward Jesus, wherever they are. I'm not asking you to bring them to an event, although you're cert certainly welcome to do that. I hope you can always feel comfortable inviting your, your friends here. But what I'm asking you to do is consider inviting them to take their next step toward Jesus. Maybe they've never taken any step, so they just need to take a baby step. Or maybe they, they've kind of halfway there, and maybe they need to take another step. I think about it like this a lot of times in this, this process, is that... We need to help people sit with Jesus and then stand with Jesus and then walk with Jesus. And that's what you're inviting them to. You're really inviting them uh, to Jesus. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, verses 18 to 20, it gives us sort of a process. It says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, here's the process. The first is that you're going to a people. You're going to a person. You're going to your neighbor, and you're going to love them genuinely. And along the way, you're going to share naturally what is significant to you. And hopefully in doing so, you're going to make a disciple. Someone is going to say, I want to know more about this Jesus that's changed everything. And one day, hopefully you get to baptize them and you'll be a part of teaching them to observe everything that he has commanded us to do, how, how to live and walk with him. And so you're inviting them to take their next step. Now, it sounds good, but how would you do that? What would you do? And so here are some things that I think we should think about. We need to first invite them to our own lives, our own lives. Um, yeah, have them over for dinner. Yeah, be intentional to pray for them. Yeah, ask them how you can pray for them. Yes, talk to them every time that you see them. Learn their names and their kids' names and Genuinely love them in every way that you possibly can, but invite them into your life and naturally share what is significant to you. Naturally share your story. Again, naturally is such an important word in our culture today. There can be no gimmick. There can be no ulterior motive. It needs to be natural, intentional, but natural. You share your story as you're sharing the things that are significant to you. Then, you can invite them to what I would 
call uh, sort of a come and see experience, right? So what is Jesus like? So a couple of examples, right? Maybe you invite your neighbors over to grill out. And before you eat, you, you grab everybody's hands and say, hey, we just, we pray before we eat. And you pray to Almighty God. And maybe, maybe they've never been to church. Maybe, maybe they've never prayed in their life. But because they're at your house and they're, you're, you have a relationship with them, them they're going to listen at least as you pray and do what you normally do. And you, you've now invited them into your faith in a, in a small way. But you can also invite them to come and see in other ways, right? You can invite them to come and see any gathering that you're a part of where other Christians sit and encourage each other, right? So maybe that's a small group of two or three that you, you meet on a regular basis. Maybe it's your, your life group in your home or here on Sunday morning, but you invite them to be a part of what you're a, a, a part of. And so you invite them to just come and see that. With no strings attached, you can, you can explore. You can see. And we're gonna love you no matter wh- whether you receive that or, or reject that. I, I would also say that you need to invite them to, to, to sit, stand, and walk with Jesus. Now, how, do you, how do you do that, right? So <clears throat> I think... It's important for us to remember that Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit for a reason. And there are lots of things that the Holy Spirit does inside of us. But one of the things he does is gives us sensitivity to what he's doing in somebody else's life. And you won't know this unless you're praying and walking with the Spirit. But oftentimes, the Holy Spirit will will tell you it is time to naturally share the gospel, to naturally share your story. Or you will hear them talking about something in particular, and you will know it's time to invite them to their, their next step and actually share the gospel. So one of the things that you can invite people to is actually to read the book of John with you. I know that sounds really simple, but the book of John was written so people would know and believe Jesus. That's why it was written. If it's the word of God, it's laced in the power of God, and there's nothing more effective or powerful you could do than than to take the book that was written uh, by God through John uh, so that the world would believe in Jesus and actually go through it with them. So you can invite them to that. I had a group that I was meeting with several years ago, and uh, that was the challenge. They had to go where they live and work and invite people to study the book of John with them. And you know what they found when they invited people to study the book of John with them? Uh, people of all stripes, all backgrounds, they said, oh, okay, we'll read that with you. Can you imagine that? That people actually often accept invitations if we will, if we will give them. And so a lot, of, a lot of people like us, they'll say, well, I'm not doing that, Right? Why would I not do that? Because I'm afraid I won't have the answer to all their questions. Right? A lot of people will say, I'm not going to invite them to do that. Let me teach you something really important. When you're studying the book of John with your friend, like you invited them and you said, we're just going to read it together and talk about it. No, no, you don't have to have any curriculum. You don't have to have any particular things. Just read and talk. Okay? And when, when they say, well, what about, what about this? And you don't know the answer to the question, uh, did you know that Jesus can handle that? You're not knowing? He can actually handle that. And it says he's going to do it. Uh, he says he'll do it for you. One, it says in the scripture, when, when he's working, he'll give you words to say. I know that I, by experience. I've been in situations where I, I have no words and he gives me the words to say at just the, the right time. Not because I'm a pastor, because I'm a follower of Jesus. Okay? So, so he will give you that. But if you get to a point and they ask a hard question and you don't know, here's what you do. Watch this. It's amazing. I, I don't know. Practice that with me right now. Ready? One, two, three. I don't know. Okay? That's actually a really good answer. And what you can say to them is, I don't know exactly what that means, but I'll I'll study it this week. I'll I'll talk to some people and I'll get back with an answer. Let's write that question down. We'll come back to it. Here's what that does. It makes you uh, seem like you're not the one that knows all the answers because you don't. 
We don't have to pretend. We don't have to fake it. We don't know all the answers. And two, it, it involves them in a conversation where you want them to ask really great questions because the whole book was written so that they would know and believe, right? Invite people to their next step with Jesus. Maybe, maybe you just need to invite them to your own life. Maybe you didn't invite them to study the book of John with you, but it all requires sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Never with gimmick. It's the third time I've said it on purpose. Never with gimmick. Here's what I would say. This is going to offend some of you. Don't lead with a track. Don't lead with a testament. Don't pull your bracelet out with five different colors or whatever that is. Green is four, red is four, yellow is four, blue None of that. In League City, Texas, Friendswood, Clear Lake, all the way to the island, they've seen all that before. It's all gimmick. What they need is Jesus and someone to share a story about him in the context of relationship. Like, I need to see that it made a difference, that he made a difference. You know, I don't need a gimmick. And so we invite people uh, to experience Jesus and to take their next uh, step with him. And I just uh, I want you to be sensitive to the spirit and, and chunk all the gimmicks. Like there was a time you could hand somebody a track like that, and, and I'm not saying God never uses it. But I'm saying in the culture that we live in, it is an instant obstacle. Okay? You share you. You invite them to you. You share what Jesus has done inside of you, okay? No gimmicks, right? So the third thing, not only do we need to invest and invite, but we need to include them. So when, when we are investing in them, we are living out the great commission, and when, I mean command. And when we are inviting them, we are living out the great commission. But when we include them, we are including them in what I'm gonna call the great commission community. Now, this is what Jesus has came to build. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 2 47 describes the followers of Jesus praising God and having favor with all people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so, this kingdom, this community that we are inviting them to is an ever-expanding kingdom of Jesus. And we want to include them in that, right? So we've invested in them by loving them gen genuinely. We've invited them to take their next step with Jesus. Now we want to include them in the kingdom of God. And the natural expression of that in the world is the local church. Not just this local church, but the local church abroad, globally, everywhere. There are local churches meeting all over this place right now. None of them are in competition if, they're, if their local church is focused on Jesus. They are all about building the kingdom of God and including people in that. And so we want to include people in that because there's nothing like it. It is a beautiful thing. So how do we include then? Well, I think we lead with hospitality. Hospitality. So I begin by showing them hospitality on my own street. See, hospitality begins with me and my wife on my street. Hospitality begins with you on your street. We lead with hospitality, and it starts with me, and it starts with you, and it requires all of us. Hospitality is a really big deal in the scripture. I don't know if you've paid attention, but hospitality is a thread from Genesis to Revelation and a mark of God's people. Now, we don't live in a culture that necessarily values hospitality like the Eastern context of the Bible. We honestly, we, many of us, come home from work, drive in the driveway, go to the garage in the back, go in the back door, right? Never see our, our neighbors, 
We're busy. Thus, we're talking about this. But hospitality, Romans chapter 12, verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality in, uh, is, is Paul's mantra for the church at Rome. Like, what do you have? What can you be to them? Hosp- hospitable. Hebrews 13, 1 to 2, the writer of Hebrews says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. But there are, uh, that refers back to a chapter in Genesis where Abraham uh, and Lot were Bedouin shepherds. They were living in tents out in the desert and Often, when strangers walk up to a tent in the desert, Bedouins, you know, you know, they need hospitality to survive. They need water. They need to water their animals. They may need shelter, shade from the, the sun. They may need food. You need hospitality in the desert to survive. I tested it. Uh, does that Bedouin thing still work in the Sinai several years ago? And what I found out was uh, it still works. Bedouin law is true. No matter who they are, no matter who you are, you get to stay in a Bedouin tent for three days, no questions asked. They will protect you. They will provide you food. They will provide you water. Okay? Um, I got the goat hair in my teeth to prove it. Um, it works. Why? Because their core value, the, the Bedouin core value for hospitality is through the roof. Now, they also have a a value called revenge, uh, which you have to pay attention to in the long haul. Uh, they have 150 years if you offend them or hurt one of them to get you back. That's also part of their law. But hospitality is a big deal, right? Now, uh, Paul was just carrying that into the New Testament church. He, he taught that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was a lack of caring for the poor and needy and being hospitable. He taught that we, in the, in the context of the local church, have to be hospitable. And so we start on our street to include people by them experiencing such hospitality, and we continue it as they gather with us. Think about this. I don't know if you've thought about this in a long time. Some of you are experiencing this today. When you actually go to a gathering of believers who know each other for the first time, Unless they have, and when you go to that, that gathering, unless those believers have an eye for hospitality, you might feel not included because they all know each other. It might not be intentional, but they all know each other and they, they might, for the love of each other, forget to look out for the people who are new that need hospitality, right? And we, we the church, Paul called us to like pay special attention to the people in need, uh, when, when people come to your life group, if they make it that far, that is a big deal. Someone new shows up at your home or in your life group here on campus and says, I want to be a part of your community. That's why they're there. You know what would be tragic is if we just say hello, get their name, and then just go about talking about to the people that we know, and they feel sort of suddenly like they're outside the circle, even though they're inside the home or inside the the group. See, the church has to be the most hospitable group of people in the world. This is what we, we are called to, and so we we, we exercise hospitality here. We want you to know where to park and what to do when you get here and all those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it is life on life. How a person experiences what is hospitable actually lets them know whether they're going to be included or not. Right? So how do you know, how would you receive Hospitality. Okay, hospitality is not like me just waving at you, saying you're glad you're here, and then moving on. Hospitality in the body of Christ looks like, I'm glad you're here, and can I sit with you? And my life group meets this time during the week or, or whatever. You want to go with us? We're going to lunch after church today. You want to go? You want to come to my house for lunch? There's this lady, I lived in Waverly, Tennessee. First grade, we moved from there. So no lie, this was when I'm four, five, six, seven years old, or six years old. I remember her name, Mrs. Steedley, right? I know that she is with the Lord now because she was older then. 
I went to her house every Sunday for lunch. Some, because she decided for some reason, like my family needed to be at her house for lunch. And we went there every, I mean, every Sunday we went to Miss Steedley's house for lunch. And you know what I remember about Miss Steedley's house? Two things. One was she, she made, this is Tennessee, right? So she made this squash casserole with like cheese and some sort of crackers on top. Anybody love that? Like I could kill that. That whole, she made a giant thing. I wanted to eat all of it as a five-year-old. I loved it. I remember that. And I also remember that I was allowed to crawl around underneath the table at her house while the adults were still talking. And that wasn't allowed at my house. So this is like some special dispensation at Miss Steedley's house that allowed me to do that. And when I think back on it, you know what I have? I have this like, like great feelings because she showed us hospitality. She led us in our home. She showed us Christian love, and we didn't, we, we had moved there, and we didn't always live there, but while we were there, we experienced that from her. We are to show those same things with our neighbors, to show hospitality, to include them by including them in our life groups, in our worship gatherings, in our prayer times, as the Holy Spirit allows us or leads us to invite them and include them to be a part of that. This one other thing you should think about when you think about including people is we should include them at their point of need. So a lot of times you'll find out with your neighbors, they're going through something. Like they're just not some random person that you wave at, but they're actually going through something. So here's a for instance. Maybe you find out one of your neighbors lost a loved one this year and they're grieving. Well, Wednesday, September 12th, we start a, a group called Grief Share. If, I, if that was my neighbor, I would say, hey, let me, let me take you to a group that's meeting uh, with our church this Sunday. It's going to be people from all over, not just people from our church. And we're going to talk about grief. It's other people that are going through it and how God can help us through. They have two choices. Oh, man, thanks for asking, but I'm, I'm really not interested. All right, no problem. Or, okay, I'll go with you, right? What have you lost? And either uh, you haven't risked much with either answer, okay? He's not gonna go, big deal. But if he does or she does, then all of a sudden you've included them at their point of need in the body of Christ where they could get some real help. Maybe they're struggling with parenting or they have counseling that they need and you don't know how to help them, but we know how to help them uh, up here. Maybe we can include them that way. Maybe you just need to be available to be a listening ear to them. There are all kinds of ways you can include people in the local body of Christ, this greater community of faith. And they can see it for what it is, not for what they think it is, or not from that bad experience that they, they had in the past. So, it's the big deal. Invest, invite, include. That's all you gotta remember, and it's easy to memorize. The thing is, you're gonna have to decide, will you actually live that out? We actually live that out. Now, the number of times that Jesus says, you should love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself is, is clear enough to me that this is the mark of a disciple of Jesus in any age. Loving God and loving people like Jesus loved people. Look, I believe he placed you in your neighborhood on purpose, in your workplace on purpose. Like, there's no reason you're there uh, particularly other than to be the missionary in that neighborhood, to be the pastor in that neighborhood when people are going through stuff. Like, I don't pastor your neighborhood. You're the believer over there. And so the question is, will you love genuinely, no strings attached, no ulterior motives, invest in people that way? Will you invite them to Jesus? Here's what I'm gonna dare you to do. You'll be shocked. Invite someone to read the book of John with you. Even if it's just the level one, like let's read just John 1 and text me some questions. I'll text you, text you back some thoughts. All the way to let's have coffee, let's have lunch together. Invite them to read this book with you. Um, <clears throat> the question is, are you really gonna, are you gonna really do that stuff? You know, are you are really, really gonna lean in and really believe loving God and loving people is what I am to do as a disciple of Jesus, where I live and where I work. Right? That's the question.
And that's the art of neighboring. I think it's loving our neighbor as ourself that will actually change the world, believe it or not. I think Jesus knew it, and that's why he said it.